You know those learning activities where you have to put the steps in order? Well, I don't know about you, but I've never been a fan. They tend to be pretty tedious, especially when there's a lot of elements, and they can be pretty hard since one object in the wrong place can screw everything up. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to build a game to make those activities a lot more fun for the learner. And bonus, if drag and drop isn't your jam, this game does not rely on it. I'm going to use historical events to place in order, but you can use this for steps in a procedure or a process, anything where sequence matters and unlike the classic activity you're going to build this once and it's going to be different every time you play it. My name is Mary Jo, I'm a former video game producer and now I help instructional designers gamify their training so if you're struggling to create learning experiences that people love and that make a real difference check out my program at the link below. All right now let's build this thing. <laughs> So here's how the game works. At the beginning, we have a pool of events to put in order, but the learner can't see them. We pick just one of them at random and we place it on the timeline. Then we pick a second one at random, which I call the test event, and the learner has to place it. Did the moon landing happen before or after the iPhone? If they get it wrong, game over, try again. But if they get it right, then my test event gets integrated into the timeline and we pick a new test event to place. Now things have gotten slightly harder because I now have three possibilities where this event could go before, after, or between. So I place that one and so on and every turn I get a new test event to place and as I go things get harder and harder because there's more and more possibilities until I reach the final full timeline. Now the fun part is my full timeline has five events but there can be more than that in my initial pool. If I have seven events in my pool or 10 or 20 that means that not every event will appear in every playthrough which creates some natural replayability. Your learner won't see the exact same timeline twice. Now if you're teaching a very specific procedure where learners need to see every single step you can absolutely make your pool the exact right size so that they'll always see all the steps in your process. They'll still get replayability because the order in which the events are presented changes every time. Maybe the first time I play this, step three will appear first and I'll have to decide if this step goes before or after. The next time it's this step that appears first and I have to decide if this step goes before or after. The point is they can't just memorize the answers. Okay, so how do we build this? Yes, I'm going to use some JavaScript, but it's simple and I'll put a link below so you can download my scripts. No excuses. And yes, this game can be built without JavaScript. I made a version of it using nothing but triggers about four years ago, but I'm still PTSD about the number of triggers that took, so we're not doing that today. It's going to be okay. First we'll build it without the pictures and then we'll add the images. So you're going to need the following variables. Event name 1 to 5, those are text variables. Event date 1 to 5, these are numbers. Position choice, which is a number. Score, which is a number. Game over, which is a true or false. Quiz name, which is text. And quiz date, which is a number. All right, I like to start with a game setup slide. I find it cleaner and I'm going to run a little script here that's going to set up our pool of possible events. Note that these are not in chronological order. You can put them in chronological order Order, it doesn't matter they're gonna be picked at random one by one anyway what does matter is that their list of dates is in the same order as the list of names so the first event is the moon landing and the first date is 1969 then the French Revolution 1789 and so on in this example I have seven events to choose from in my pool here I'm saving these lists to memory so we can use them later and here I'm setting up a timeline this is gonna be the timeline of five events that we're gonna be building as we go through the game at this point there are no events on my timeline because I haven't picked one at random yet so that list is empty and we're going to need a timeline of event names and a timeline of event dates and once that's done we jump to question one to set up question one we have to pick our first event at random which I'll call the anchor event and also my first quiz event this one right here so first in this script I'm loading my list of events and my list of dates that we just made then I pick my first event that I'm going to place on my timeline here so I pick a number at random between one and the length of this list which happens to be seven. So let's say it picks the number three at random. It looks up the third event in the list. That's the fall of the Berlin Wall. So that's event one. And it looks up the third date in the list, 1989. So that's the date of event one. We don't ever want that to be picked again. So we're removing the Berlin Wall and its date from these two lists. Then we're adding Berlin Wall to my timeline. Right now that's the only event on my timeline and I'm saving that timeline. And finally, I want to tell Storyline what to display here. So I'm going to pass Fall of the Berlin Wall into this variable here, event name one. I'm also telling it the date, which is a number, but that's not displayed anywhere. 
Next, I'm gonna do the same thing to pick this quiz event at random. My pool of events is shorter by one now because we've removed Berlin. So we're gonna pick from the remaining events, set my quiz name, set my quiz date, and let's say for example, that's the printing press. And we're gonna remove that from the pool of events, save the updated pool of events, and then tell Storyline what's the name of this event here. And that's it, we're done setting up question one. Now when the learner picks one of these, I'm simply setting a variable called position choice to one or two, and then I'm gonna go check to see if that's right. On this check layer, this script grabs the event date from Storyline, so 1989, and the quiz date from Storyline, so 1440, and also what position did I pick, one or two. By default, we're gonna say that the answer was incorrect, so first we set game over to true. But then, if the learner chose before, i.e. position one, and the quiz event was indeed before event one, then I'm gonna switch game over to false. Same thing if they picked position two and the quiz event was after event one. That would be right as well. So these are the two ways I can get this question right. So assuming I got this question right and game over is false, we're then going to go to the layer correct. On the layer correct, we're adding 25 to the score because it's four questions, so 25%. And we're gonna wanna save our current timeline, which now has two events in it, printing press and Berlin, because in the next question, we're gonna wanna display those two events in order. That's the timeline that we're building. So on the layer correct, here are the two ways I can be right again. If the quiz event is before event one, then I'm gonna set the timeline to quiz event first, then event one. If it's after, I'm gonna do the opposite. So the timeline's gonna be event one first, then quiz event then I'm gonna save the timelines. I'm not gonna show you all the other questions because they basically all work the same way. Set up the existing timeline and pick a new test event. Then check my answer. If it's incorrect, end the game. If it's correct, you need to insert the test event in the correct spot and save the timeline again. The only difference is as I'm building the timeline, there are more and more scenarios. So let's just look at the last question where there are four events on the timeline. That means there's now five positions for me to choose from. So in the check script, it's doing the same thing. It starts by assuming I'm wrong and then it's seeing if any of these situations has happened, in which case I'd be right. For example, if I picked position one and the quiz event comes before event one, then I'm correct, so game over is false. And we're going to insert that quiz event right here at the beginning of the new timeline. These are all the five possibilities here. And on the final you win slide, we just need to display the perfect timeline. So there's a little script that just goes and tells Storyline what the names of each event is. So now when I test that, it works perfectly and I can get all the way through it. The beautiful thing here is if I want to add an event, it's super simple. I just go to game setup and I add it to the list right here and I put its date here. And now it's going to be among the events that the game can present to me. I'm sick of seeing this ugly version. So I'm just going to give it a little bit of polish before we move on there. Now let's build a version that shows me an image of each event. Not only is that gonna be prettier, but it also reduces mental load because the learner doesn't have to read as much. So the first thing I thought about is I would have these shapes here and they'd all have a different state based on my seven possible events. So here each object would have the same seven possible states and based on what the event is, I'm gonna change the state of this object. But I immediately realized that that was gonna be insanely time consuming because if I wanna just add one event, I'm gonna to have to change each one of these objects to add that state on every single question. So no. So what I decided to do instead is I'd have my pictures off to the side where I don't see them and depending on which event is in which position, I'm just going to move the images to the right position. So for example, if event number two is the moon landing, this image here is going to move to this position immediately when the question gets set up. So first I'm going to create an image for each of my events and make sure that they're in the right size and shape that I want them. And then because I don't want to copy these on each slide, I'm going to put them on the master. Then for the logic, I'm basically using the same script logic as I was doing in my non-image version, but right at the initial game setup, I'm also going to add a list of numbers just so that I can have a simple ID number for each event. So there's just like one more list here. Then I'm going to store this list of IDs and keep referring to it all the way through the game as I update the timeline. That's the only difference in my game setup. Okay, so now let's change the setup of question one a tiny bit. Here are the differences. First, I'm loading up my list of numbers that you just saw, and there's this ugly stuff here. This part is naming each one of the pictures. These are the names that Storyline gives to each object I put on my stage. So if I wanna tell Storyline to move an object, I have to use Storyline's name for that object. I'm not making up that name, obviously. <laughs> Storyline is, and I can see that name by right-clicking on the object, and it appears right here, and I can copy that if I want. But there's 
there's an even easier way to do it in JavaScript. I just pick the object that I want in this drop down here. So image one and I add it and it creates this line here. Same for image two and so on. So that's what I've done here for each. So now I have a list of the names for each image. Note that if you download my scripts and paste them into your storyline, they won't work unless you do this and change the ID numbers for your own images. So put your images on your master and then open execute JavaScript, print the correct IDs for your storyline and then copy this. And then you can cancel out of that. Going back to my question one slide now, I'm going to paste this here to let my script know what images to move. Then I make a list of these. I save a backup of my events and their IDs. And then just like in the non image version, I'm going to pick my anchor event at random, just like before. I'm going to set my anchor name, my date, its ID, and then I'm going to remove them from all my lists. Then I tell storyline what the name of this event is so it can show up here. And I'm also going to create my timeline with just that one event in it for now, just like before and save it. But now we have a new thing to do. We have to move the image into this position here. So whatever ID I picked, let's say it's number two, the French revolution. I'm going to go find that image in my list zero, one, two, and that image, image number two is what I'm going to move. And I'm going to move it to X position and Y position. Now, how do I know these exact coordinates? That part's easy. I just took one placeholder object. I placed it where I want image number one. And then I just look at its current position. I write those down and that's the position of my event one. And then you get rid of this placeholder. Then I pick the quiz event. I remove it from the list. I save the new list. And then I'm going to move the image to this position and that's it. I'm done setting up question one. The check is the same because it's only looking at dates. So it doesn't care about the images. So the check script doesn't change at all. You don't touch that. And if I'm correct, then it needs to update the timeline properly. But the only difference is now I'm making a timeline of names, a timeline of dates and a timeline of ID numbers. There's no image stuff in this script either and so on and so forth until the final question where you can see that I'm placing each and every event in the correct position. I've got event one in this position, event two over here, three and four. For each one, I've had to put a placeholder object where I want the image to be and write down its coordinates. That's how I knew what the coordinates were to put in this script. And now the game works perfectly with the images. A couple of variations you could add. It would be nice to add a skip button to this game. So if a learner is totally stumped by a particular test event, they can just use the skip to swap it out for another random event. Just an idea. This would help support learners who are a little behind but as usual, you don't want to overuse this because the activity does need to be challenging. Another thing you could do to make things slightly easier is to provide the dates for the events that have already been placed on the timeline. That gives a little extra information to make deductions. It all depends on what your learning objectives are. But as you can see, effective gamification isn't about fancy graphics or expensive tech. This took an afternoon to build and now I have a template that I can reuse for other types of content. And this game challenges learners to think, it provides immediate feedback back and it creates replayability without you needing to build 10 different versions of the same activity. So if you want to build it, download the JavaScript from the link below and follow along with this video. And if you want all the strategies, the games, the frameworks, the techniques that create genuine learning without the fluff, check out my program, the effective gamification framework. Now go make something awesome and I'll see you in the next one.